este, a ver, uno acá que ir a la ID, voy a ir a la ID. Uh oh, it sounds like we have somebody who's unmuted. Uh, this is Tamara Bingham, Director of Business Development at Center for Change. Um, but I don't hear them now, so maybe we're okay. We'll just keep going, and if we need to remute, we will. So hello, welcome everybody. We're so happy that you're here. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm here with Dr. Nicole Hawkins, our presenter today. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping items to do before we turn it over to Dr. Hawkins. So we'll do that really quickly and then I'll introduce her and we'll get rolling. A copy of the PowerPoint is in the handout section of the toolbar. So you're welcome to reference that if you'd like. It's also on our website under the professionals tab and the webinars tab, you'll see it there. If you wanna reference it in the future, you're more than welcome. A copy of the post test is in this handout section of the toolbar. This is for reference only. We'll talk more about this in just a minute, but you're more than welcome to open that up, take a look at it, keep an eye as Dr. Hawkins is doing her presentation to, to keep an eye on those um, answer uh, test question answers. Uh, you're welcome to submit questions in the question section of the toolbar. We'll try to get to a few of those at the end of Dr. Hawkins' presentation. There's a lot of us on the call today and we're so happy about that. And it also makes it complicated in terms of having folks um, be unmuted or be on, um, on screen. And so we ask that you submit your questions in that question section of the toolbar. I'll keep an eye on those throughout the presentation. And then at the end, we'll come back and, and get to some of those questions. When the webinar ends, there will be an evaluation that will automatically pop up on your computer screen. If you'd do us a favor and just take 30 seconds or so to complete that evaluation, that would be really helpful. That's a continuing education requirement for us. It's completely anonymous, so feel free to be candid in your feedback. We tabulate those results and then send those to the CE providers um, to finish out our CE requirements. And then uh, what everybody wants to know is about an hour after the webinar ends, you'll receive a separate email with the link to take the online test. Um, you must take the test online in order to receive continuing education credit. Um, uh, once you pass the test, that CE certificate will automatically be downloaded to your computer. If you don't see it on your screen, check your downloads folder because it's likely there. Okay, we are so happy to have Dr. Hawkins um, presenting today. It's been a while since Nicole's presented for Center for Change. She's a busy person. Uh, and so we're thrilled to have her. Dr. Hawkins has been um, at Center for Change for, we were just talking before we came online, 24 years, going on 25. Um, I feel like I've been there a long time because I've been there 16. And Nicole's been there uh, since almost the beginning. And we're so thrilled to have her be our CEO. She's been the CEO of the Center for a while now. She's a clinical psychologist. Um, she's an expert in eating disorders. Um, her specialty is certainly uh, body image and most, most recently social media, um, which she'll tell you all about here shortly. So I'm excited to have you present. Nicole, I'm going to send it over to you. Let's get this going. Perfect. All right, it's coming to you. All right, Perfect. can you see me? You're see up it? and running. I'm going to turn Perfect. off my camera and my microphone, but if you need me, I'm right here. Just holler. I'll pop back on. Otherwise, I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Hey, thanks, Tamara, and welcome, everyone. A couple other things to know about me is I'm recovered myself, so I'm going on 33 years. I had anorexia and then bulimia and binge eating disorder. So I might tie some of that into my presentation as I go. I'm going to be speaking pretty um I guess pretty quickly because I um, have an hour and a half presentation that I'm going to try to get done in an hour. And I know I only have an hour, but um, there's so much information that I thought was so valuable. I want to make sure you guys um, get it all. I will warn you ahead of time. Some of my content's a little triggering. So whether you're female, male, I mean, you have a partner with an eating disorder, you could find elements of this presentation triggering. So kind of to start with that. So I'm gonna talk about the power of the media, the social me media, the diet industry and intuitive eating. And I like to start with this very, this first picture. I think it, I think it really shows what we're struggling with in society. This image is from a model on the runway. She looks quite ill, even under her eyes, you know, it's, it's dark and, and she's paid a thousand dollars a day or more to look like this. Meanwhile, um, we have treatment centers that are charging that much a day for patients to not look like this. 
And so that's some of the issues that we'll be talking about today and what's going on in society. So if I didn't have you guys all on a webinar, I'd be asking you to raise your hand right now and answer these questions. And usually at the Center for Change, we don't like to talk about weight or numbers. Um, I am going to break those rules for a minute. And I just want you to think, like, what is the average height of a, the woman in the U.S.? And when I do this with during family days that we have every month at the center, people usually guess about 5'7", five, 5'6", five, um, and they usually overshoot. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that the average American woman is 5'3.5", five, so some of you could be saying I'm tall, and when we look at the average weight, it's 170.8. So the average size of women in the US, in fact, two thirds of all American women are a size 14 or larger. The problem was, with that is there's no representation of that, that size. If we were to go to the mall right now, we, it would be a struggle to find that size. And so that's another thing we'll be talking about. And then when we compared that to the average model, now the average woman, that's based on the CDC, that's pretty current data. For the average model though, this, this data now is three years old. It's harder to find data on the average model. But if you see this at 5'11", 117 pounds, a size two. In fact, about 1.8% of women genetically in the world can look like this without doing a darn thing. But we see this image over and over and over again. And it's represented, they estimate about 80 to 90% of the images we see are this BMI. And there's actually been research tracking these two numbers. The average woman to the woman in the media since the year 1900. And we, this is the largest discrepancy we've seen. So I know you can't really see this um, graph, but you just can kind of look at it. And the blue signifies women in society. The yellow signifies like women in the media. So you can see this complete disconnect. And you know, this is a landmark study in the area of body image, but you can see how outdated it is. It was last done in 1996. And in 1996, 60% of our Miss Americas and 69% of our Playmates met the criteria for anorexia. If you wonder what it is today, now we know the average BMI is about 16.9 or lower. So you can really see how in the media these images are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So we've had a lot of models and, and um, celebrities pass away from eating disorders. A lot of times it doesn't make the news. In fact, it, we don't even really hear about it. And I'm gonna talk about why for a minute. I think most of you probably listening to this webinar are aware that eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. We were number one, but remember during COVID, the opioid crisis um, overtook uh, our numbers. And so right now we're number two. And I think we've all heard about the opioid crisis, right? We hear about it every time when we um, talk about or when we turn on the news. In fact, if you watch Netflix, there's a great documentary out there right now. Well, it's not a documentary. It's a series um, called Painkillers about it. Um, I would recommend that. So we hear about it all the time but no one's really talking about eating disorders. And so right now we're the second highest mortality rate of eating disorder deaths we count. And in this country, the only deaths right now we count are deaths attributed to anorexia if the individual is underweight. So if your loved one or if your patient passes away from bulimia, so again, if their electrolytes get off and they go into cardiac arrest, which we used to think, well, that takes a few days to happen. Now they're saying, you know, it could be one episode. One episode of behaviors could be enough of taking laxatives, di diuretics, or purging could be enough to make those electrolytes go off and for that patient to have cardiac arrest. Those deaths in this country are currently not counted. Um, so that's a problem. And so if we really look, it's about one death every 52 minutes. And less than 6% of individuals with eating disorders are actually underweight. I think you guys all are aware of this, but again, there's this focus on anorexia. As many people die of eating disorders as breast cancer each year. And if you look at the funding from 2021, you can see the research spent on breast cancer versus the research spent on eating disorders. So why do these numbers matter? And why does prevalence matter? So this is the current research from last year. 
And for example, my grandmother passed away from, from Alzheimer's. So you can see for every one person that has Alzheimer's, $60 goes to research. For every one person that has autism, $56 goes to research. For every one person that has schizophrenia, $8.65 goes to research. How about for eating disorders? $1.91, that's all. I use myself as an example. When I had my eating disorder, I had 20-20 vision. Every year in my eating disorder, my vision got worse. I, of course, was not being honest about my behaviors. Um, and then once I recovered, my vision stayed the same. It did not get better, but it not, did not get worse until I hit my 50s and now I need bifocals, but it didn't get worse. Now, here's the thing. I can find research about going blind from anorexia. I can find research about your retina detaching from purging and going blind in that eye if you don't get emergency surgery. I can find research on blurry vision. I have only found one small sample size of research on progressive vision loss and eating disorders. That's not because it doesn't happen. It's because we're not researching it. And so, and I can say this as a recovered person myself, if we're not advocating for ourselves, no one else may be advocating for us as well. So the last couple of years, I've been CEO at the Center for Change for four years. And two of those years, I was diagnosed with cancer and I had to have treatment for that. And so of course, when I got my um, treatment plan for my cancer, I looked at everything it said and I did everything they said. Oh, you need to have surgery. Um, we need to do this. We need to do that. I did it all. In my eating disorder, when I got my treatment plan for my eating disorder and I went down the list of things I had to do, I crumpled it up and I threw it away. And I said, you know what? That doesn't apply to me. And it, what I wasn't advocating for myself. So I'm gonna explain why eating disorder patients do that and why a lot of times our decisions um, are not very rational. So before I worked at the Center for Change, I actually had no intention of specializing in eating disorders. And I worked at the VA Medical Center and I was training to be a neuropsychologist. And so when neurosurgeons would be in doing brain surgery, I would be the psychologist in the room as, asking them questions and mapping out portions of the brain. So I've been really fascinated with the brain um, since then and I still am. So what I'm showing you right now is the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. So that's kind of the front part of our brain. So let's kind of review what the prefrontal cortex does. That's like the CEO of our brain, knowing is this a good thing for me to do or is this a bad thing for me to do? Any of you have teenagers or remember being a teenager, remember teenagers prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. So when we talk about these behaviors, just think about a teenager for a minute. Planning of complex cognitive behaviors and thinking about consequences. So if I do this behavior, I could end up with osteoporosis. If I skip class, I could end up with a poor grade in the class, right? So really thinking through those consequences. Empathy. A lot of our patients were the most sensitive person in the room. We call them the turtles, right? They pick up on everything. They observe the world, they take it all in, but we can see if the prefrontal cortex isn't working, they kind of lose that empathy. That They're not as sensitive. Um, this is why mom and dad can be crying, trying to beg them to go to treatment and they don't care. Um, they lack insight. They lack response flexibility. So this is why they can get very, very rigid. Personality expression, their ability to regulate their emotions. When I train new therapists, I say, please do not diagnose eating disorder patients with borderline personality disorder until they're out of their eating disorder, because by definition, so many of them cannot regulate their emotions, but that is why so many of them um, need DBT skills, ongoing decision-making, moderating social behavior, being able to identify how they impact the room, and then impulse control. So these are all important things the prefrontal cortex does. So in this image I'm showing you right now, you wanna see yellow and red in this scan and that shows the brains lighting up. So let's look at a typical eating disorder brain. What's going on in the prefrontal cortex? Not a whole lot. Now this is actually an anorexia brain. The binge eating disorder brain looks identical. 
Um, the bulimia brain, I have a couple scans of that. It has a little bit of yellow in the top part um, and a teeny one little spot of red. Why? I don't really know. No one can really explain it, but it does light up a little bit more. I have been unable to find an ARFID brain. I'm assuming the ARFID brain is going to look pretty close to this. So again, I went through college with my eating disorder. It doesn't mean um, we can't, we're not capable of things, but when it comes to that higher level thinking and thinking about consequences and planning, our brain is not fully accessed. So I wanna show you 90 days in structure. You can see that the brain is start, starting to light up. Now, please know if you have a client that struggles with substance abuse, we need to double this time. So if they have another addiction, this is gonna take a, at least six months to get it to light up. So this is why I always say PHP, IOP, outpatient, having a, a good relapse prevention plan is critical for these patients. But this is why we don't follow our treatment plans, and this is why our team becomes so critical. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears for a minute, and you've probably all seen these images when you go to the grocery store, right? But how about these images? Where did I get this? This is from Vogue magazine, and it's not a special children's edition. Vogue magazine actually had 10 and 11 year old girls in their magazine because they were struggling to find women that represented this small body types to be in their magazine. And why do they want this small body types? Because they found the thinner the image, the more likely we are to buy it and the product will sell. So let's remember that theme as we keep on going and talk some more. Okay, how about the um, woman here in the red bikini? You may not recognize her. I wouldn't know who she was. I only knew who she was after she made the front page of the newspaper because she was Miss Universe. And after she was crowned Miss Universe, the pageant officials got together and they said, huh, she's a little thin. Maybe we should set some minimum BMI requirements after she won. This other young woman, you may not recognize either. This is actually one of my neighbors. This is her at New York Fashion Week. Everyone in my neighborhood was so thrilled that she was walking the runway. I was not. She is 13 years old. And the reason I was not thrilled is because I knew the case of Garen. Now, for those of you who have been in the industry for a long time, you remember the documentary, America the Beautiful. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend you see it. It's, it's a little older now, um, but it's still excellent. Uh, they follow Garen from age 12 to 16. So Garen at age 12, where this image is taken, she was the US's youngest runway model. When she is 16, she actually goes through puberty. They measure around the hips. She is three centimeters too fat to be a model. So I guess in this country, you have to be a six foot tall 12 year old to be thin enough to model. And in this picture, she's not smiling because she was actually missing baby teeth. I think most of you um, recognize the other woman here, Nicole Kidman. I promise you, I just don't read the National Enquirer, but it says Nicole's secret medical tests. Her secret medical tests revealed that she was at age 40 diagnosed with osteoporosis. And what they found is when she did the movie Moulin Rouge, and she was reportedly uh, 5'10", 110 pounds, and they still thought she was too large so they put a corset on her that was so tight, it cracked, I think, three or four of her ribs. So again, this is the damage that when we're in an eating disorder, we're doing and we don't realize. So this is a post I had on Instagram. I, I'm going to be explaining later why I don't post on Instagram anymore. But the top image is a 25-year-old female with no eating disorder history. The second image is a 25-year-old female with five-year history of an eating disorder. The bottom image is a 30-year-old female with a 15-year history of an eating disorder. So again, this is the damage, and we know males with eating disorders, they're damaging their bones at a higher and quicker rate. So this is why getting bone density scans becomes so critical. And again, when I had my eating disorder, because my prefrontal cortex wasn't working, I wasn't worried about these kind of things, and I didn't think it would happen to me. Now, probably most of you recognize Jennifer Aniston. This is all the way back from 1999. 
This is back when Jennifer Aniston was doing Friends and actually back when Jennifer Aniston was fired by her professional um, fitness trainer, Kathy Kaler, is exercising too much because she was exercising eight hours a day. We're gonna talk about how then her body still wasn't even good, good enough to be on the cover of Red Book Magazine. They say bigger's better, skinny, scary, but we all know that's not true. We know when celebrities gain weight, their body's shamed. I do love this. It says there are 3 billion women who don't look like supermodels and only eight who do. You will never see this ad because the makers of Barbie and Mattel actually sued the body shop um, for making Barbie fat. But I don't know if you guys are aware that ever since 1959, when Barbie came out, they redesigned her every single time to make her thinner. And I will show you the curvy Barbie that came out in 2016. You know how I did air quotes? When I say curvy, you can judge for yourself if you think it's curvy. But even in one set of memos about Barbie, they even described her as having cankles. So I don't wanna you know, completely hate on Barbie, but um, for those of you that have known me, I've been talking about Barbie for like 25 years. And so now the movie's out. So I did have to add some new slides. So let's go back in time for a minute. In 1965, this is the height of the women's liberation movement in the US. We are getting equal power, equal access. It is an important time for women in this country. So at that time, Mattel decides we should put two really important items in Barbie's box because this is slumber party Barbie and she's gonna go sleep over at her friend's house and she needs to pack important items. So what do they put in her box? And now I have to always show a picture because people don't believe me. They put a scale set at 110 pounds because according to Mattel at 5'9", that is Barbie's happiest weight. And then they put the book, How to Lose Weight. And what does the book say? Don't eat. So again, I'm not making this up, but when you think about what to do to take away women's power and the height of the women's liberation movement, getting us to focus on our weight and our bodies definitely can be the source of that. So this is a, a woman that's recovered from an eating disorder that made what Barbie would look like if she was an actual um, real life person. Even Sports Illustrated put Barbie on their 50 year swimsuit. Um, anniversary edition. I like to show um, a documentary and I don't show it anymore because it definitely dates me. But those of you that can remember, this is Carrie Otis. Carrie Otis was a famous Revlon model. And this is her when she was in Sports Illustrated Millennium Edition back in 2000. She was married to Mickey Rourke. She was on the cover and she had multiple pictures within the magazine. Well, right after these pictures were taken, three weeks later, she had open heart surgery to repair holes in her heart caused by her eating disorder. And so she said, even though I looked really good, I was literally dying. So does Barbie really impact us? Does it really matter? There's actually been a lot of research on this. And studies have found that girls aged five to seven years old reported less body esteem and a greater desire for a thinner body after exposure to Barbies compared to girls that saw a more normal Emmy doll. This study fascinates me as a psychologist. You may have seen it. It was on um, USA Today. It was actually on the cover. So for 20 minutes, little girls either played with a Mrs. Potato Head or a Barbie doll for just 20 minutes. And then they were asked about career aspirations. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, girls that played with a Barbie doll, it literally limited their career aspirations. They did not believe they could achieve as much as girls that played with a Mrs. Potato Head. So let's look. So these are the new Barbies that came out in 2016. Um, and, and again, I challenge you to find the curvy Barbies in these images. So this was their, their tall, their curvy, and they're petite, and I think it was supposed to be their ethnically diverse Barbies as well. And research on 16 to 14 year old girls found that they were definitely impacted by these images. And I'll give you some research now on the current images out there. So this is um, from a researcher from Pepperdine. So she showed young girls the new images of Barbie that came out in 2016. And over half of the girls selected the curvy Barbie is the one that was not pretty, 
She was the most likely to be the one that has no friends. She was also the least likely to be happy, smart, or pretty. Only 6% of the girls in the entire study picked her as the doll they'd want to play with. And 25% said they would not play with her because she was fat, chubby, or big. If we look at some other studies now, this one is just two years old, where they asked um, little girls played with either these ultra thin bar Barbie dolls or Monster High dolls, or they could play with more normal dolls or even a car. And they found once again, that these girls that played with these thinner dolls, it started impacting their body image and they started preferring these thinner images. So is the Barbie movie a good thing? I had refused to see it, honestly. I thought, how can I go see this movie? All I do, I never let my daughter play with Barbies. I was completely against Barbie dolls. And I thought, and then all of a sudden, all my friends are hashtagging, this is a feminist movie and go see it. And then my old, my own 22 daughter, 22 year old daughter went and saw it and loved it. And she's like, mom, you gotta come see it, right? So there are some, some cool things about the movie. Um, it definitely looks at patriarchy. It definitely has some funny like jabs at Mattel, which is amazing because they signed off on it. But here's some of my concerns about it. Number one, their stocks went up 33% since the movie. So I guess we all should have bought stock in Mattel before the movie. Toys R Us sales are up 30%. And Mattel reports, oh, that should be a 34, not a 3%. Um, Mattel reports that Barbie doll sales are up 34%. And that was just a stat that came out last week. So even though I think the movie has a lot of great things, I think this could be a moment for Mattel to capitalize. If you've seen the movie at the end, they talk about ordinary Barbie. What if we could create an actual ordinary Barbie? The problem is, is would women buy it? And what Mattel will say is no, those dolls don't sell. So as we talk about some of this, and we talk about the thin ideal, that's gonna be the challenge to all of this, or to all of us, is do we keep on buying in to this ideal and do we keep on buying it? So again, I don't know if this research matters or not. I played with Barbies growing up and it didn't impact me at all, is what I always say with my long blonde hair, right? So, but I think it does, right? So we're gonna talk about airbrushing now. There's a lot on the slide. The only thing I want you to pay attention to is the average magazine cover costs $60,000 to produce and six months to airbrush. So this is Jenny McCarthy on Shape Magazine, or is it? It's obviously not her. You can actually even go on YouTube and you can, if you, if you search slice of pepperoni pizza, red bikini model, you can actually watch it happen. When I show that to my patients, they still get triggered. So even when they know the image is not real, just seeing it will still trigger them. Katie Couric, she had um, bulimia in college. When she was hosting the CBS Nightly News, they told her she was too fat. They were gonna airbrush all her material. She said, you can't, I'm Katie Couric. They did it anyway. I thought Faith Hill looked fine. Um, I don't know what's going on with Fergie's legs. Even plus size models are not allowed to be plus size. I purposely don't follow the Kardashians, but I think this is quite funny. How to lose 10 pounds in 10 days after having a baby? Well, this is how we do it. We just go get airbrushed and even the baby looks better, I guess, right? This one is a really sad one to me. You may have seen the story about the, this model. She was on Good Morning America. She was on the Today Show. Um, she was a top Ralph Lauren model. Both of these images have been airbrushed and Photoshopped. Both were taken in the same time period. She was promptly fired after the one with her in the plaid shirt and the blue jeans because the retouching bill sent to Ralph Lauren was $82,000. Again, I guess I'm in the wrong business. I don't even know how that's possible, but she complained, she tried to get her job back. She did not get her job back. Here's an image too. You're seeing the entire ad. You may wonder what is the product? So this is actually a performance perfume ad. And what I like to challenge my patients with now is instead of getting triggered by the ad to go, huh, what are they, how are they trying to sell me perfume? And in fact, I'm so put off by this ad, I might stop buying their product. Imagine if we could all do this. 
Imagine as consumers, if we could stop buying products that we don't support. And that's why, again, going back to Mattel, I guess it's great that their Barbie sales are up, but I want a different option. And I want a different option for mothers to buy their daughters. But if we keep on buying those Barbies, they're gonna keep on making them. Now, I haven't um, boycotted Target yet, but you may have seen this ad came out probably in your mailbox three years ago. Um, I, I think Target was not sure what the thigh gap was, so I call it the crotch gap, right? Um, the other thing about this model is her arms are really long. If you saw her on Ellen's talk show, she is actually adorable in real life. And she went on, on Ellen's show and she wore um, fake arms down to her um, ankles and she just had fun with it. So at least she got a little bit of fame out of what they did. So this is back when Jennifer Aniston was working out eight hours a day and she was on the cover of Red Book Magazine. It's not her, it's not her body. The only thing that was real, it was her hand and her wedding ring because she was married to Brad Pitt. Same with Julia Roberts, this is not her and same with Kate Winslet. So this was back in 2004, you guys. So they all sued the publishers of the magazine and they said, you can't do this, you can't Photoshop us. And they all, if you remember, lost the lawsuit because amongst us, the general public, we're all aware that these images are fake. But are we? No, and I don't think our kids are, I don't think our patients are. And this is gonna tie in once we start talking about social media. So just one to really date me, this movie I think is 34 years old. You can obviously tell this is not Julia Roberts' body. If you've seen this 34 year old movie, it's not her body in the movie either. And it's so old, if I assigned it to you as homework, you could definitely tell that they use body doubles throughout the movie. So now let's talk about pro anisites and Instagram. You know, years ago when I used to talk about pro anisites, it used to be websites. But now we really see this on our social media. And what we've seen the media do, I think now social media has taken to a whole new level. So I wanna focus on talking about TikTok, Twitter or X now, and Instagram as kind of the, the leaders in negative content. So I'm gonna give you some stats first. These are all pre-COVID numbers. So we're gonna keep that in mind because then when COVID kind of hits, everything changes. So pre-COVID, elementary students were viewing about six hours and 32 minutes a day. We used to see that 68% of children had televisions in their room. And if they did over a three year period, they were more likely to have disordered eating. Now, of course, they have devices in their hands, right? They have devices on their, their wrists. It's not, we're not really needing to tie it to televisions in their room. So if you look at the Nielsen um, research, they say the average American is spending about 11 hours a day using media. This is more time than even spent sleeping. If we look at teens, 13 to 18, they're spending about nine hours a day, and then eight to 12 year olds, again, six hours a day. Here's what the research found. After only three minutes of looking at the thin ideal, like all these images I've just shown you, 70% of you should be feeling depressed, guilty, and shameful. And then we know that the more we see this, these images, we start to internalize them. So I was the first researcher back in 1990. I started the research in 1994, finished it in 1996, 97. And I was the first researcher to expose women with eating disorders to the thin ideal image. And I used images from Vogue, um, Glamour and Cosmopolitan. Basically, after 30 minutes of looking at these images, eating disorder patients were so triggered, their anxiety went up so high, their depression went up so high, their body hatred went up so high that my research committee that um, consisted of six psychologists sat me down and said, Nicole, we would have never have let you do this research if we knew showing these type of images was this damaging to women. Because I had a population of college women too that were completely triggered. Now again, that was back in 1996. As we look at social media, we're going to see now, I can't even quantify the number of images young girls are seeing. So social media began to take off in 2010. The first iPhone was released in 2007. 
Facebook started allowing anyone age 13 or older to join in 2006, Twitter launched the same year. Instagram launched in 2010, Snapchat launched in 2011, and this is when things dramatically changed for the young girls in this country. So let's start looking at it. We automatically started seeing skyrocketing rates of depression. So look in 2017, one in five teen girls between 12 and 17 reported having a major depressive episode. Major depression, one in five. By 2021, three in five of our teenage girls had major depression, double the rates of our boys. In 2021, 25% of our teen girls in this country had made a suicide plan. Now, I saw one media story on this. This should be big news, and it wasn't. You maybe saw the CDC um, results that came out this year. This is based on their biggest study of youth risk behaviors, 17,000 high school students. Girls, they now have persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness for our boys. Depression is exhibited with irritability and aggression. 57% of our girls now have major depression. And look at our one of our most vulnerable, our LGBTQ plus community, 69% now have major depression. This I'll kind of explain to you this graph. It's heartbreaking to me. So this is the rates of depression. So if we look at the, the red line, and that's the top one. That's 12 to 17 year olds. And you can see from 2010 on, right around when Instagram started, look at the rates of depression for our 12 to 17 year old girls. The blue line is our 18 to 25 year old girls. They're struggling just as much. The, the next, the green line, that's people, you know, 30s and 40s. And then I'm in the yellow, you know, my 50s and older. We're just kind of, we're just kind of maintaining. But the younger girls were seeing this spike. This next one is even more dramatic. So again, we're looking at from 2010 on. This is rates of ER visits for self-harm or suicide. Look at our females. It is skyrocketing. Even our males, our males are double what they used to be. If you look at the line that's with both, with males and females, our kids are not all right. And no one's really talking about this. I think we wanted to talk a lot, you know, during COVID, what kind of, what happened and people were isolated. But I think we were also missing the conversation about social media and what was going on with social media and how it was impacting our kids. So then our Surgeon General this year actually released an advisory and that sent teens who spend more than three hours a day on social media face double the risk for poor mental health outcomes, including depression and anxiety. Social media, and this is from the report, Social media may perpetuate body dissatisfaction, disordered eating disorder, or disordered eating behaviors, social comparison, and low self-esteem, especially amongst our young girls. 46% of our girls say social media makes them feel worse. Only 14% says it makes them feel better. 64% says they're exposed to hate-based content. If you're working with adolescents, ask them about their social media. Ask them about what they're viewing. We know that platforms are showing live depictions of suicides and of self-harm. And we're gonna get to that in a moment when we talk about Instagram. And we know that on typical weekdays, nearly one third of adolescents report using their screens until midnight or later and that about one third of our teens say they are addicted to social media. This study, and this is just kind of a challenge for all of us, this study had a group go off of social media, 
for just one week. The other group could have normal use. Now, normally when you do research for a week, you're not gonna find statistically significant results, but this study did. Just by going off social media for one week, the participants found significant improvements in their well-being, their depression, and their anxiety. So let's talk about Instagram for a minute and really talk about is this a safe platform for the girls in this country? And I'm focusing mostly on girls. I could do a whole nother presentation on boys, um, but on this presentation, I'm focusing on girls. So of course, Instagram is free. So I think our kids are the product. So I think some of you remember in 2021, so two years ago, it was about in August, September, Frances Hagen, she was an executive with Meta. She left Meta disgruntled and she did not like their business practices. She left and she took 100,000 pages with her. She turned those over to the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal then did an investigation on all 100,000 pages. And you maybe remember, Congress did some hearings. And basically, the senator out of Connecticut, he made a fake 13-year-old girl site with a staffer. They went to one pro-eating disorder site. They didn't like it. They didn't follow it. They just viewed it. They logged off that site. The next day, that 13-year-old site was all full of Pro eating disorder content. And basically, in Instagram's own words, they said, we make body image issues worse in one in three girls. What they found is Instagram was intentionally pushing eating disorders, self-harm, and suicide content. And from their own analytics, they showed that the more they pushed that content, the longer young girls stayed on their platform. So what did they do? they kept on pushing the content. So we saw the first lawsuit in this country come in 2021. Their young daughter had an eating disorder and here's the complaint. It alleges that Instagram's artificial intelligence engine almost immediately steered their then fifth grader into an echo chamber of content glorifying anorexia, self-cutting and systematically fostered her addiction to the app. Then we found the second lawsuit. Meta knows its product is contributing to teen depression, anxiety, even suicide and self-harm. Why doesn't it change these harmful product features and stop utilizing algorithms and connection, at least with teen accounts? Because it can't, it needs these young users. So where are things now? Now this is in multi-district litigation. And so there, are over, I think right now we have 1,600 families signed up. And so for any of you listening that's been a part of this, thank you so much. I actually brought the attorneys um, to the Red Sea meetings with me, and that's the Residential Eating Disorder Coalition meetings, um, because we're trying to recruit more families. And the goal of this multi-district um, litigation and why I've kind of paired up with these attorneys is we're not gonna shut down Instagram and TikTok. We, we know that, but the hope is, is that we can get them to put some guidelines in place. If you have not seen um, the documentary TikTok, it's on Amazon Prime. It's, I think, a year old now. It even has a whole section on eating disorders, how they purposely target eating disorders. But the hope is, is that we can get them to do more like what they do in China and regulate um, social media a little bit more, have some time limits. In China, kids can only be on TikTok for 40 minutes and they see very safe content. So in China, little kids grow up and they wanna be astronauts. In the US, what do little kids wanna do? They wanna grow up and be influencers. Um, I'm not gonna be able to show this Dove video. Oh, maybe it will. Okay, it will show. Nicole, I don't think it's going to have audio. You don't think it's going to go? Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Let me go back and let me go back to my slideshow. Okay, so I didn't think it was going to play. So, um, whoops, I'm going to have to skip through really quick. So, if you have not seen that dub video, go on their website. It is brand new and it's about social media 
and it is excellent. And it's part of kind of what we're doing with the, um, the, the, the Child Safe Act. And it was made, but I'm kind of glad I can't show it because it makes, I've seen it like 10 times and it makes me cry every single time. Okay, let me get back and I'll just skip through it really quick. Okay, so let's talk about TikTok really quick. You know, we have a little more access to, to Instagram and, and to see what they do. TikTok is a whole different thing and it's even more concerning to me. I don't know if any of you guys know who this influencer is up here in the corner. His name is Noah Beck. He um, has the most, um, I think, followers on TikTok. Uh, he has, for a male, he has 36 million followers. So the, the interesting thing is during COVID, when he had to leave college and my daughter had to leave college, she actually helped him start his TikTok. And he went from one follower, her, to 36 million. In that same time period, when she's living in my basement, she saw her first pro eating disorder TikTok. She'd never seen one before. Actually, TikTok's promoting eating disorders. She ran upstairs, she showed it to me, and then I watched it, so we watched it twice. Her entire algorithm then was pro eating disorder content. And those of you that work in the industry, you've experienced this. I have to be up to date on what's going on with TikTok because the minute there's videos on going to an inpatient treatment center and getting a feeding tube on TikTok, we get our call volume goes up. So TikTok to me is even more dangerous. It's harder to regulate, but please know this multi-district lawsuit we're doing is targeting TikTok as well. So I know a lot of Wyoming, um, Wyoming has banned TikTok. I don't think that'll stand up in their state. Utah has done some things as well, but everyone's afraid of them um, stealing our data. I'm more afraid of them impacting our children. When we look at the hashtags, what I eat in a day is one of the biggest hashtags. This study last year found what I eat in a day, 3.2 billion views on TikTok. The hashtag weight loss, 10 billion views. So again, TikTok is definitely more than cute little dance videos. There's a lot of content about weight loss and transforming your body. And they found actually 44% of the content was on weight loss. So let's talk about dieting because that's something else that's pretty prevalent in our society. We know that up to 90% of women go on a diet in the course of the year. For men, it's 47 to 72%. Men just don't talk about dieting as much as women do. We know that 98% of all diets fail after five years. What does the word fail mean? It means dieters regain all the weight they lost plus more. One of the largest federally funded studies back in 2006 looked at every diet out there. And if you guys remember, the plan of this study was if they could find a diet that worked, they were going to change back then the food pyramid to be in line with a diet. So actually like really smart. Um, the problem was is none of the diets worked. First quarter of results, everyone was losing weight. Didn't matter if you were on Slim Fast, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, um, Atkins, everyone was losing weight. By the end of the year study, all the groups were a little bit higher than they started. So what did our government do? They left the food pyramid alone. They put a runner on the side and they shifted the colors. That's why it didn't change back then because they knew um, diets didn't work. We know by age six, little girls are already concerned about their body and wanting to lose weight. We look at elementary school students and we know that 42% by first and third grade want to be thinner. When asked, 41% of nine and 10 year old girls said they felt better about their bodies when they were on a diet. I'm not too sad about Forever 21 being in bankruptcy. I'm not sure if you heard what they did in their warehouses. Anything that left their warehouse that was labeled plus size, they included an Atkins bar. When they were caught on that, they said, oh, that's a mistake. We don't know how that happened. So if we look, and now finally some of these stats are including boys, um, because I don't want to um, minimize how this is impacting our boys, but we look now that boys are losing weight and trying to lose weight, they're dieting, they're using exercise. So this is obviously a prevalent problem. We know that up to 57% of our adolescent girls engage in crash dieting, fasting, self-induced vomiting, 
overweight girls are more likely than normal weight girls to engage in such behaviors. So to me, the diet industry, when you look at what's going on with social media, the diet industry has been doing all this damage for a long time. Research shows that young children and girls are more afraid of becoming fat than they are of nuclear war, cancer, or losing a parent. Now, I do not have time to go into the 2023 American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines, but let me just say this. I have this young, this young man up here with his jaw, jaw wired shut. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, in this country, we used to wire people's jaws shut for weight loss. Now, somewhere we decided as a culture that wiring people's jaws shut for weight loss was just not a humane thing. But somehow now we have pediatricians and guidelines recommending for kids 13 and up, let's not wire their jaw shut, let's just remove their stomach. So again, um, this fat phobia, this, this focus on dieting, I am just so concerned for this younger generation. So these studies really show why dieting doesn't work. Stice and all looked at 700 girls over a four year period. Girls that dieted in ninth grade were three times more likely to be overweight by 12th grade. Field and all looked at 15,000 teenagers, found girls who dieted frequently were 12 times more likely to binge than non-dieters. I feel like in, in my eating disorder, that's why I went from anorexia to bulimia. Why? Because I was restricting and then I started binging. Stice and all looked at 1,000 girls over a four-year period, found their initial dietary restraint score, how much they dieted, strongly predicted the onset of major depression. So there's a lot of research to indicate that with eating disorders, up to 80% of our patients or our clients had an anxiety disorder prior to the diagnosis of the eating disorder. When they started dieting or restricting or doing behaviors, it brought down their anxiety they felt better. So in my case, I felt so much better. It was the best I'd felt in a long time. The problem was, is my anxiety started coming back. So I had to do more and more behaviors to try to bring my anxiety down. But then my anxiety was coming back. So I was doing more and more behaviors. The next thing I knew, I was in a, I had a major eating disorder. We'll sit in that cycle of anxiety, eating disorder, and then I'm gonna sprinkle in some OCD. Sit in that cycle, you're gonna end up with major depression. And then, and for me, that is why I see it with so many of our patients, the suicide rates. In the last 10 years, I've never experienced like I do now. So I wanna talk really quickly about this, that anorexia sufferers are 31 times more likely to make a suicide attempt than the general population. Research reveals that most anorexia-related deaths now could be due to suicide. Individuals with bulimia are seven times more likely to die by suicide. Males with eating disorder exhibited more than double um, the attempts than females. And then our, again, our LGBTQ plus community, 58% have considered suicide. This is a very vulnerable population. And please know this is a general, but when I, when I teach on suicide and eating disorders, we know with individuals, and this is a generalization, but something you should be aware of, individuals with anorexia, they tend to have more planned out attempts that are more lethal. Jumping off bridges, jumping off buildings, um, stepping in front of trains, where individuals with bulimia tend to be a little more um, impulsive, um, could be self-harming, overdosing, taking pills. Um, but then we know with males, we can see that lethal with um, guns and firearms. So again, this is why um, focusing, assessing, asking our patients about this becomes so critical. So I want to end really quick, and I just have a couple minutes and talk about intuitive eating. Now, I am very aware that there's now 10 principles, but I have to tell you, when I started um, working at the Center for Change over 24 years ago, I was recovered for seven years. I was not an intuitive eater. In fact, I had never heard of it. I was very, very skeptical, and I know that my first day of work happened to be what they call Cheesecake Challenge, well, Challenge Day. My first day was Cheesecake Challenge Day, and I was required to eat, shadow the patients, and eat three pieces of cheesecake in one day. 
And, and literally I, I said, I don't know, these people here in Podunk Orem don't know what in the hell they're doing. They're feeding the patients junk food. This is so unhealthy. The dietitian um, that started intuitive eating with us sat me down and she was recovered herself. And she said, Nicole, please try it. Please, you know, just see what you think. As you can see, I'm pretty transparent. Um, so I thought if I'm going to work here, I've got to at least try it. And I would say it changed my life. Now we recognize that intuitive eating is not gonna work with all patients for, for a number of reasons. Number one, first they need to know kind of correct portion sizes. We don't want our patients weighing and measuring out food, but when they come to us, we will put them on 100% and we'll kind of give them samples and examples so they know what to plate. But if you go down to the other one, honoring your hunger fullness, right? That is gonna take time. And the receptor in your in your stomach that can talk to your receptor in your brain, those can start miscommunicating. So we know um, having structured, what I like to, to say is, is we do structured meals um, that let them be more intuitive about their choices, but not about necessarily their amounts and what they need to eat. So if you're a lay person and you don't know much about intuitive eating, I would strongly encourage you get the workbook, um, do some reading about it because I really myself have found it a valuable too, tool and I feel like I was recovered, but I would have never have had what I see as now a full recovery and a much better relationship with food. Tamara, I don't know if we have any questions that you want me to go to in my last couple oh my minutes. Goodness, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many questions I cannot keep up. So first of my apologies to our attendees who are um, typing in questions and I tried to respond to as many as I could saying, we'll try to get to them at the end. But if I didn't respond to you, my apologies. Um, Cause you know, I'm a talker. I just take all my time. No, you did. You did great. Uh, there are a lot of questions. If you would be so kind as to say where the video the, that we couldn't show, where to find that. Yeah, so the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty if you just go in and search and it is an excellent they have lots of videos they've been doing this for years this by far is their best okay thank you now before mm -hmm. we get to the rest of the questions i need to do two housekeeping things real quick but you know we recognize there's a lot of folks on who are clinicians who likely have to hop off at the top of the hour to see a, a client so i want to get this out of the way and then if we go over time with a few questions we won't be able to get to all of them but if we go over time uh, at least everybody knows how to take the test. So when either when you log off or when I stop the, the webinar, um, an evaluation will automatically pop up on your screen. If you'd be so kind as to fill out that evaluation for us, we would appreciate it. It's a continuing education requirement for us. Uh, it's completely anonymous, so feel free to be candid in your feedback. Uh, once all of those uh, results come in, we tabulate those and send those to the CE entities uh, as our final step for approval. And then about an hour after I uh, end the webinar, you'll receive a separate email from GoToWebinar. It will look similar to the email you got, the confirmation email you got when you signed up for the webinar. There'll be a separate one coming about an hour after we end. In that email is a link to take the online test. You must take the test online in order to receive continuing ed education credit. Once you pass the test, that CE certificate will automatically be downloaded to your computer. Uh, if you don't see it on your screen, check your downloads file. All right, Nicole, here we go. Um, okay, uh, this first question is from Allison. She, Allison says, hasn't the media in recent years been more weight inclusive? I feel I see more models with larger bodies today than ever before, perhaps not in high fashion, but certainly for places like Target or Old Navy. Do you see the trend on social media and among young people becoming more weight inclusive? You know, yes and no. I think Victoria's Secret is a great um, example. I think probably 10 years ago, I stopped shopping there. It was not a conscious choice, but I think I found the store too triggering, honestly. Um, and they, uh, I guess a lot of us stopped shopping there. So if you see the mannequins and their models now, they're, they're a lot more inclusive. I agree, Target and Old Navy have, have tried to do that as well. So I think they're trying, but what we're seeing with kind of the images on social media, the images on the runway, it's still not catching up. We saw even as the Kardashians bought body type 
um, got a little more curvy, that trended in society. And then Kim went back to that kind of 90s heroin chic look. And all of a sudden we saw young girls wanting to lose weight again. So unfortunately, I think it still has a big impact, but I do agree. I think it's gotten a teeny bit better. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn says, what are your favorite books? And she said, I would love one written by you, which is so great. And, and just so everybody <laughs> knows, uh, I've been begging Nicole to do a book for a long time. So the, I know, I know. Have, uh, well, <laughs> my, um, I'm doing a webinar in October um, and I'm doing it on basically data I get gathered to on the 10 principles of recovery on data I was going to write a book on, but I, I don't think I'll really write a book. Um, I would say now that I'm going to go way back in time, but I'm going to go to one of my heroes and Margot Maine and her book Body Wars. And when I first read that book and, you know, Margot's a feminist, that's why then I took on all the Barbie stuff and the media stuff. And um, because I think, I think it's really important. And I think, and again, I feel like a lot of this has gotten lost in the big push with the Barbie and everyone thinks it's so great and it's this feminist movie, but we're selling more dolls that are gonna damage girls. So, um, but yeah, Body Wars by Margot Main. And then of course, Intuitive Eating. I, I really like that book. Thank you. Uh, okay, Tori asks, does the research on social media actually indicate causation of mental health and eating disorders or can we only conclude correlation? We can only, so that's a great, question we can whenever we look at most research we can only look at correlation but boy the numbers are speaking for themselves right and in this litigation they are trying to show causation now i don't have time to go into it but there is some litigation in the uk for a young girl that took her life and and she um she took her life and they were able to show in discovery that she had went and viewed self-harm or suicide images on Instagram and had seen 12,000 of those images. So again, correlation causation, it's hard to say, but in a court of law, they went with causation and that family won that litigation against Instagram. That's why Instagram is gonna avoid anything going to discovery in this country and they're gonna settle this um, lawsuit. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we have several questions about Ozempic. You had to know it was coming, right? So uh, it's, every, it's everywhere. So this question is from Gracie. Thanks, Gracie. Has there been any data or concerns for patients using Ozempic with eating disorders? Well, we probably they do all a whole want webinar it, right? on that alone. Yeah, we could do it. So, you know, I wasn't as up to speed on Ozempic. And then I went and spoke to 300 public health nurses about eight weeks ago and they educated me, and they educated me on all the complications they are seeing. And then I've also, we're here in Utah, and our biggest insurance um, coverage, or carrier, Select Health, is now educating their patients on the dangers of Ozempic, because they are Ozempic, because they are seeing their stomachs become paralyzed. And this insurance carrier does not wanna pay these long-term medical bills. So I say more to come with this, um, the story is not over, but when you have insurance companies now trying to educate patients on the dangers of a medication, that's a problem. That's a problem. Thank you. Okay, we'll do one more question, uh, and this it kind of puts uh, questions from a num number of people all together, which is, are there positive social media accounts that you would recommend or that you like or that you help uh, might point your, your clients towards? Yeah, you know, years ago when I did the research, when I was going to write a book, believe it or not, 10 years ago, social media was seen as a positive thing. And so we would share positive accounts. My, and, and there are a lot. My concern with Instagram now, and any of you that are on it, you can validate this, is now they bring up sponsored accounts. So I have felt like I've kept my Instagram pretty positive with like puppies and furniture and little things like that and cat videos, but then I get those sponsored videos. So when I run groups with my patients, I do like them to share examples of positive, but then we talk about unfriending, unfollowing certain hashtags and just have them be more media literate and have them admit to what they're doing because a lot of times they don't wanna tell us. My patients, I just ran group with them um, two days ago and asked them about their social media use. 
A lot of them said pre coming into treatment, it was 10 hours a day. And the research shows that adolescent girls check their device 19 of the 24 hours a day. Doesn't mean they're on it 19 hours a day, but they're picking it up and checking it. Okay, wow. I know I've taken us over. Sorry, Tamara. You know I just you talked. did awesome. That's okay. I'll tell I'll tell folks. I we had a number of people also ask. Can there was a lot of information? Can I view the recording? The answer is yes. Give us about a day to get it uploaded to our website at centerforchange.com. You go across the top of the options, you'll see a professionals tab. If you click on that tab, then you'll see the webinars um, a tab there. And uh, all of our webinars are, are archived there. So you'll see the upcoming webinars first. And then if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see the archived section and Dr. Hawkins webinar. Today's webinar will be there. So if you'd like to view it again or share it with anyone, you're more than welcome. We're so grateful everybody could join us today. We have so many of you online and we're so appreciative and, and grateful. And thanks to Dr. Hawkins for a, a phenomenal presentation. Everybody stay well, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye.